Hello, Ecompulse listeners, and welcome to another episode of our show. I'm so excited to host Yoni Kosminski today, co-founder of Multiply Me and Scala, a serial bootstrap entrepreneur. Yoni, how are you? Welcome to the show. Eitan, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, excited to sit down and chat. Yes, I mean, uh, you're one of my guests that I have like a million topics to discuss with you. I mean, you've done so much, both in the, as an entrepreneur but also in the business and definitely in the business of uh, marketing and e-commerce. And tell us about Multiply Me and Escala. What do you do these days? For sure, yeah. I mean, uh, we can definitely take it to a whole range of topics. Yep. Uh, but uh, as it relates to Multiply Me and Escala, uh, Multiply Me, we're an end-to-end -end executive search recruitment firm focused on, on really being an HR business partner for people looking to build high-performing remote Filipino teams. Escala, on the other hand, is a process improvement management consultancy. So we took a team out of Ernst & Young in the Philippines where they were working on you know, very Fortune 500 companies, building SOPs, process documentation, accountability and org charts, those things. And we really wanted to make it uh, accessible for e-commerce businesses, US-based brands and, and companies that were looking to scale but couldn't afford the, the very high ticket price tag. So effectively together, you know, they work very closely with one another where we're helping businesses really understand how do they build commercial scale and, and profitability into their business. Interesting. So what uh, inspired you to launch these, these businesses? Well, I'd have to go uh, <laughs> all the way back to the, the start of my, my career. I spent 10 years in creative advertising and, and digital marketing strategy in Australia and then in the US working with uh, small agencies, you know, anywhere from, uh, let's say, 15 employees to 40 employees across the agencies I worked with, but with big name household brands like Master, Sony, Mercedes-Benz, Medtronic, and so I always had sort of the vantage point of seeing what it was to work in a small business, but what it was to work with a big corporate. And when I came to Israel a little over seven years ago, I met a couple of guys that had an e-commerce business that was doing about $2 million in revenue and realized that while they were incredible founders and you know, very good at picking products, uh, they weren't building a sustainable system that actually could produce the volume of work required in a really meaningful way and so effectively built an agency for that company with my co-founder um, we built a customer support function you know we had designers project managers operations managers video production specialists we built sort of the works out and that company grew from two to five million in about 12 months it was acquired and on that journey all the talent that we had hired were from the philippines and having worked with such big uh, clients and worked, you know, I would say at a, a pretty meaningful sort of size and stage of the creative advertising, digital marketing space, I realized that this was something that could really have material impact. So that was sort of the, let's call it the brainchild and the, 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 the testing ground where we said we could really help a lot of other brands do this. And that was, that was where the idea came from. And that's, that's really become like a really uh, driving and meaningful passion both to help companies grow and, and do it profitably but also um you know i don't know how much experience you've had with filipinos i know we touched uh on it in previous conversations and you do have experience but for people listening I, i've fallen in love with the culture as well and so that's a really beautiful thing knowing that we can support an incredible culture and provide value to the clients that we're serving too yes i mean we are in an era of like increased focus on operational excellence and uh, profitability and kind of the fractional everything era, right? So both on the executive level, but also on the various job functions that, got, that are becoming more and more specialized, right? On different tasks and different communities. Tell us more about this uh, Filipino culture and why you choose this place and what type of uh, capabilities or functions that you have there that can help you know businesses definitely brands and businesses in the u.s absolutely before i share about the philippines you touched on something that i think is really interesting uh when it comes to uh both the topic of conversation but a topic of consideration when you are building a business you talked about sort of the you know i don't know i can't i can't exactly remember the direct quote but it's like the rise of fractional resources you know you see yeah. a lot of 
fractional CMO and COO and integrated solutions. And, and there's become like a really big push for that. And where I see, I see a lot of value in that. And we have also been leveraging it. I think one of the interesting things as you become sort of a business of material substance is that the needs that you have will soon sort of outgrow that fractional resource or the costs attached to them. You know, they might be three, four, five, ten thousand $10,000 a month. They are sort of the strategy mindset thinking and, and developing. But if you have them working on sort of the executional task work, mm-hmm. you're not really building the right leveraged ratios. So coming back to your question about the Philippines, um, I would say, you know, and I can share a lot of the mistakes that I've made throughout mm-hmm. my journey. I would say, you know, for, for, for those listening, we grew from, you know, a team of me and my co-founder to 120 people in about 18 months where there was two of us and 118 people in the Philippines. Today, we're closer to about 80 people uh, or 90 people, let's say, in the Philippines. And we have a larger footprint here, both in Israel, Australia, and the US than we did back then. Uh, And we have a smaller footprint in the Philippines. And what we did was we over-indexed and said, you know what? Every single person that sits in a Western geography can be replaced by someone in the Philippines. And you know, I would say I learned the hard way, what we would define it as like operational debt. We went too far into one direction. So it's about finding that mix. So coming back to it, you find incredible talent in the Philippines for a whole variety of roles. The areas that I'm very familiar with is everything from, you know, uh, graphic designers, video production specialists, appointment setters, customer support functions, project managers, operations managers, accountants, accounts payable, receivable, the list goes on. It's, it's quite expansive, but that is to say that where you're going to get the most utility, where you're going to see the most value in bringing in some really high caliber talent is by also making sure that you have some strategic minds or you have either that fractional resource that's helping build the strategy or I would say better yet, if you can afford to have someone like that in-house and connecting all of the pieces. So having a you know, a CMO, a COO, a CFO, all your C-suite can live in sort of, you know, your either local geography or a Western geography, depending on where you sit in the business. I think you're going to see your business succeed far more in giving them, and I'm not talking about executional tasks here, like don't don't misconstrue what I'm saying in thinking that what I'm saying is you get, get someone who can do like a task list. You can get some really high quality designers. You know, I would invite anyone listening to look at any of our websites. You know, everything that's produced there is Filipino content writers. You know, my Webflow developer is out of the Philippines as well, full-time in-house. You know, my designers, like they're all my in-house team, but I build the, I build the strategy and I, I, I really help to articulate. But they build my brand book and guidelines like it's mm-hmm. it's about building the right ratios is is really the the point that i'm laboring here <laughs> nice so you've been doing this for quite a while and quite successfully you place more than more than a thousand employees already what for for you is an ideal setup for, for a u.s brand for example in terms of you know hiring versus outsource let's try to define you know the company and its major fun- functions and what is your recommendation for, for a best practice, maybe, if there is one? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I would say it comes down to a couple of things. I think there's two ways you can approach uh, like delegation or or also, you know, you sort of have to look at it um, holistically. So you have to look at, obviously, the most important thing is you need to look at what are your actual capabilities from an operating expenses perspective and what can you afford to take on? So that's one component that you obviously need to consider can i afford to bring people on in-house um do i have the skills and capabilities to bring them in-house so when you talk about um you know uh, doing this from the standpoint of like outsourcing it or you know delegating it to a company where they're accountable and responsible let's say that you have no experience in email marketing hiring you know a very low level copywriter who doesn't really understand the strategy behind it but ultimately you bring them in, you say, do you do my email marketing? That's, you know, we're going to be okay. I, you know, I think that's where you sort of need to make that clear distinction and say, do I have the skill sets and can I afford to bring them on? So, you know, if you're outsourcing something entirely, so you're handing that function off, then, you know, you, you have to know enough to be dangerous to ask the right questions. 
if you're going to build a remote team, then I would say you need to have a degree of understanding of like what it is you're building. And that's why coming back to my previous point, um, that's why you want to have those strategic people who are sitting in house that can actually, be, you know, I'm trying to think of the right terminology here, like having enough chefs to, you know, your cook staff, you know, you, you need to make sure that you're not trying to bring in too many of the people just, you know, doing the legwork like we did. And, and, and as a result, you know, we had functions that were so inefficient and just like, you know, things that I can say early on, I was not proud to put that, my name against, not only was I not proud, I didn't even realize we were doing it because there were so many things that were being built in, in perpetuity. So yeah. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but but if I didn't, then then go again with the. No, no, I think it makes a lot of sense. And sometimes, I mean, you don't know what what you don't know, right? You think you're hiring this email marketing expert, and you get what you get, but it can be like you know, ten levels above in terms of the, the expertise and the professionalism, and um, some no one is able you know to make so many decisions about so, such you know specific functionalities and. Like in marketing, obviously, there are so many tasks to do and you have operation and you have product development and support and obviously data. So, and it's, and again, as we said, it's becoming more and more complex. Any, any of these areas, um, just work, you know, with experts, right, to, to, to leverage knowledge that is available out there. So in a typical scenario, what are the challenges uh, companies face when scaling remote teams and how does Multiply Me address them? So the types of typical challenges that companies would ha have when it comes to actually scaling remote teams, I would say is one, you know, a lot of the time we sit and we, we look to sort of point the finger at, at the talent. You know, we hired that person and they were shit. Um, but in, in, in actuality, and I think this has taken me a, a long time to accept or even realize in myself, is that everything when it comes to business and in life in general, for me, comes down to planning. And so making sure that you're taking a really systematic approach to it. So where a lot of people fail is that they don't build a really clear picture of what success looks like at the starting point. When you're going to hire someone onshore or offshore, you need to understand what success looks like when you bring this person on. How are they going to actually improve the position of the business or the business function or the role that they play inside of that function? What does success look like in the first point before you actually bring them in? And then once you get to that point, you make the deliberation and you have a really solid uh, recruitment process where, you know, for example, you build something like a scorecard where you have the desired mission of that role, the outcomes and the attributions. What does this pe person need to actually be able to uh, display in order to be successful? Making sure that you're measuring them against one another. So mm -hmm. that's like the early stages. But I would say where people really start to go wrong, especially if they haven't had a lot of experience in an outsourced environment, is that you know, there's plenty of books written on this topic, but onboarding is such a critical step in getting these things right. And so the first 90 days, which is the title of an incredible book, but also the most critical stages when it comes to when you go through your recruitment page phase is making sure that the person that you've selected understands where they sit, understands how they can get some quick wins with the projects that they run and make sure that you're actually having like reoccurring touch points, knowing that you can't just tap them over the shoulder and say, hey, come here. I would say, you know, back to the where do people go wrong? I think too many people, whether it's local or remote, will say, you know what, just come and shadow me. Hmm. Watch what I do for the next couple of weeks and then you'll get it. And with that kind of structure or lack of it, you're bound to not only go wrong, but what's more is that you are the bottleneck and you will ultimately become frustrated in realizing that without you moving forward or coming into work, there's no way that they, this person can progress and achieve their their sort of value proposition that they're, they're looking to bring. So I mean, I can go on and on. I'll, I'll maybe stop there because I feel like you might have some more questions. Here. No, it's it's really interesting, of course, obviously, and also the onboarding process, which you which you mentioned before, which is obviously something that I wanted to to discuss again uh, with you. Maybe you want to elaborate how is a typical process works. Ab absolutely. So, I mean, you asked like, how does Multiply Me support uh, as well as the secondary part of the question? So. Yeah. 
in our in our specific sort of delivery mechanism, you know, obviously we understand that not everyone has a professional recruitment process, and what's more is that it's it's hard to find good talent. Period. You know, you can obviously throw a a, a job description up on a job board and sort of hope to get the outcomes that you want. But for us, we have a team of about twenty full time dedicated recruiters, and you know, we do a lot of what we would what is defined as passive candidate searching. So we're looking to find people who have roles currently are employed and we we effectively like headhunt them to find good work and because this is their daily existence so you know for someone like you or me we can step in and look to recruit i'm actually going through this process now looking for someone here in israel to sit across my um, sales and marketing function and i realize just the amount of time that i need to invest in going through you know a rigorous process in identifying the right candidate scheduling interviews going through an assessment test having a follow-up like there's a lot of work that goes into finding Mm -hmm. that so you know coming back to it that's what we do is we'll go through that process you have a dedicated recruiter we're giving you weekly updates we look to whittle it down to a top three and only once we have a top three will we then put in front of the client assuming that that goes to plan then the next step for us is actually you know that onboarding phase so we build the onboarding plan we work with the company to help you know uh, the 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 new hire understand the culture understand the systems and the technology that's being used understand what the expectations are and even work with them to build out things like performance management understanding exactly what they need to do and then when we bring a scala in from time to time we'll also build out all of the process maps and standard operating procedures for functions so that it's very very clear coming back to it instead of having someone follow you around all of a sudden you have very clear documentation on what each step of the process looks like and what they need to do so that becomes their knowledge base or their company wiki or you know, there's a million different names that people mm-hmm. use for it today but it's the yeah, lms um mm-hmm. it's it's effect it's effectively where all that and then sits and it allows them really to set them free to achieve all that they uh, would like to and then parts of that also come into effect where we have like an account manager where we help no longer really facilitate, but provide sort of the guardrails so that you could be doing things like performance reviews and leave tracking and 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 things that you know I'd say like more professional uh, HR business partner companies will be looking to support others in their journey and achieving. Yes, and what are the type of engagement models that you have? I don't know you have a few. What are they? Can you please share? Yeah, so so we have two models. Uh, we have, you know, the really simple one to look at is what would be classified as just a, a typical recruitment model where we'll go off, we'll look to find the talent. Uh, you know, it's a success-based model. So once we've found the talent and the client or the prospect is happy with it, they'll pay us a, a one-time fee. They'll own the relationship with that talent. And, you know, should something go wrong in the first 60 days, we, we'll replace them. That's the the first model, the really mm-hmm. simple one. And that's like a, you know, that's a very traditional old world model. Um, and one, honestly, that we are trying to move away from because for us, it's about perpetual value creation. How do we, how do we stay aligned and attached on an ongoing basis so that we're actually not just helping someone find great talent, but helping them build their dream reality where, you know, day by day, they're removing themselves from not yeah. just like the very tactical executional tasks, but like also a lot of the tasks that, you know, become like middle and senior management style tasks. So in our other model, which we would define as full service, is instead of paying an upfront fee, you'll pay us an ongoing an ongoing fee. But what that will include is us handling healthcare, payroll, social security, HMO, Phil Health, 13th month, all the government mandated uh, elements that help you not only attract great talent but retain it. It's a really valuable lever what's more is we have a really robust onboarding uh, capabilities and and in that model again it's all baked into it so instead of sort of paying for it a la carte at a premium we say right we want to make sure we get this right we can also do things like the process documentation and sops and help build on that accountability chart help build the strategic hiring roadmap in saying how are we going to see you out of being you know let's say you're the 
marketing manager today and you're working on Canva that you probably shouldn't be as well as doing the content writing and doing the outreach messaging and the partnership and you know the SEO outreach all the different functions that you are sort of trying to be the Swiss army enough we can say right what are the what are the things that are adding the most value right well media is a big component let's bring you in a specialized meta media buyer or a Google yeah. AdWords campaign manager and we can work with you to achieve that and so in this model it's a much higher touched and ongoing solution. And I think the big benefit outside of sort of all these value added things that are baked into it is that if anything should go wrong at any point, so if you fire the person, they don't work out, if they resign, we'll replace them. No questions asked because for us, it's about building that long-term value and saying, you know, assuming you're still committed to going down the path of talent in the Philippines, obviously, but you know, from our experience, it's it's such a force multiplier and it's the only way that we've been able to bootstrap, you know, a relatively low investment in this business to build into, you know, uh, I would say revenues that most of the startups here in Israel dream of. Yes. <laughs> you know? Yes, yes. Yeah, we'll talk about that in, uh, in a few minutes. I just want to ask you about the other side of your business with the Scala, the management consulting. What exactly do you do there and which companies you know, fits, fits your services. So from, from a Scala standpoint, uh, in that business, what we do is we'll go in and we'll get on a discovery call and we'll define the problem statement. You know, what are we looking to solve for in that business? And, you know, while all businesses are unique and different, there's, you know, a general subset of problems that companies operationally will have, you know, um, there's not a whole lot of internal cohesion and, you know, sales isn't talking to marketing, isn't talking to operations or it's very much founder-led and they're working really deeply inside of the business or you're having issues around um, visibility and standardizing of performance management or understanding how to build proper retention levers or career mm-hmm. paths or, you know, all the different things. So we'd go through and we'd understand the problems on the back of that, we would put together a proposal for a project. And assuming that looks good, what we then go is we go into uh, effectively three phases. So we go into our first phase, which is our assessment phase. And that typically takes, depending on the size of the company, uh, we've so to come back to part of the question, we have cut our teeth and worked really closely in the e-commerce space at the start of the, the, the journey of the business. And that's still our sort of bread and butter, so to speak, and our most common client. But we've worked with SaaS companies. We've worked with a lot of agencies. Um, you know, it's become quite expensive. We're in like some pretty obscure niches now, like in the Painters Association of America. <laughs> We're working with like home restoration companies. And, you know, at, at the end of the day, coming back to the point I was making is that um, while we can provide like real expert advice in how to restructure companies in the e-commerce space, um, for a lot of these more sophisticated businesses, just having us bring it all together and give them even lower level guiding, supporting ideas of how they can structure, maybe not having the same level of depth of knowledge is, you know, can be a paradigm shift in how they see their business and how they can operate. So in phase one, we assess, we have our maturity analysis framework. We tell you sort of where you fit based on your people, process and technology, which for us makes a system where you sit on the scale We'll give you all the current state process maps and all the areas for improvement. We'll make a whole host of recommendations on what your org chart should look like, what your accountability chart should look like, how that you know how that all ladders up. And it's a pretty uh, heavy deck, maybe fifty pages, mm-hmm. forty to fifty pages. Assuming we align on all of that, or we take feedback and we make changes, we move into phase two. Phase two is where we actually start to design that future state. So, how do we now make this optimal? So. With the recommendations we made, what does the process now look like and what do the process maps look like? And we have sort of these five levels of process hierarchy. And then the last phase is the integration phase where we're actually build out that future state, we'll build out all the standard operating procedures, we'll build it into a training platform like Trainual or into ClickUp or Monday.com with a company wiki. We'll define every single step-by-step action in the company and connect it back to that wiki as well as building project management workflow automations to say, you know, for example, I want to launch a new product, start workflow, and all I have to do is assign who's responsible. I have all the step-by-step information, and and that's the output. It typically takes, again, I need to get on these discovery calls to understand, but it typically takes about six months would be our average project in Scala. Wow. 
And if I understand you correctly, the focus is on operational transformation, like within the company, processes, tools, teams, right? Around, around specific pain or a specific challenge that has been ident identified. It's a nice way of framing it, operational transformation. Yes. I'm going to, I might borrow that from you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Please do. Please do. Great. Wow. Amazing. And all of these are like bootstrap businesses. And I like to learn from you. And also, I believe our listeners will be very excited to learn on some of your bootstrapping tips and right, what's your style of doing things and your mindset around this, uh, this way of launching businesses. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy, I'm happy to share, you know, one of the things. So one of the decisions I had to make when I had helped grow that company from two to five million and it was acquired, you know, the decision that I was making at the start was a couple of things. One, it was very uh, Amazon centric as a company that was the major revenue driver. Mm -hmm. And it's an incredible platform and an incredible marketplace. But I knew that one, the level of monetary investment that what I would have needed when you also look at the cash conversion cycles of e-commerce businesses was going to be quite substantial into the hundreds of thousands of dollars with the sort of the product category that I was looking for, you know, and I, I wasn't, you know, at that point for me, I probably would have had to have taken on uh, debt. Um, so, you know, that was one of the things is if I could sort of invest around a hundred thousand dollars, I wouldn't have to take on a considerable amount of debt mm -hmm. or, or go down that, that path. So that was one consideration. The next aspect of it was that as great as Amazon was and as fast as you can grow a business there, you still have a degree of dependency on the platform and things can shift and change. And I was concerned that I would look to build a business that market conditions might change. And, you know, we're seeing a lot how challenging it is in the e-commerce space in general this margin compression that's happening. So that was also one of the deliberations that I made. And I would say um, at the early stages of Multiply Me, you know, I, I looked at the unit economics of a business like this and understood that even with margin built into us finding this talent and working through it, it's still going to be so lucrative for the clients that they are going to move from paying someone, you know, let's call it $8,000 a month to you know, one or two thousand dollars a month, even with our fees baked in. And so, if I can save someone, you know, twenty, you know, if I can save someone eighty percent, sixty to eighty percent on their staffing costs, that's a massive win for them. Sure. And if we can make enough margin on that, where if we do it at the volume that we're doing it at, then it's a real win-win. And so that was sort of the decisions. I would say, like, I maybe like a lot of young entrepreneurs or you know younger entrepreneurs i'm now in my late 30s and when you know i was starting this i was in my early 30s and i thought i could take everything on so you know a year into multiply me we're like this is going great and sort of said let's launch a scala and so we launched the process improvement and you know this is also the time i think you, you touched on it really early on in the conversation but um Money was free. All all the e-commerce aggregators were literally borrowing at zero percent interest rates. Yeah. Like you could stand up a a debt facility, hundreds of millions of dollars. Like it was crazy. They, they were just throwing money at everything that moved. And about seventeen billion dollars of venture capital and debt was raised just in that space alone. So you know we were doing good work, but everyone had money to invest, and the e-commerce space was really really thriving. So you know it was like we couldn't do anything wrong. Like the business kept growing and then that business kept growing. And then we built a joint venture, which we didn't talk about here with an investment bank and a fintech. They gave us $50 million from a facility to invest in e-commerce businesses to grow them to exit. And, you know, what had happened is, you know, we have a couple of investments still operating today, but I, you know, I would say me personally, but us as a business, we lost focus. You know, it's very hard when we were particularly at the time quite founder led to be working on multiple, um, multiple sales, uh, you know, functions and trying to bring in a project here and talent there and investments here. And so what I had learned, we also had a team of 15, like one of the reductions in size is we had a team of 15 building technology internally as well. So we effectively had like four businesses running concurrently in three or four years. And so coming back to it, you know, we were growing, um, but we were growing at 
not in a like not in a, a hockey stick graph uh, reality that everyone dreams of. But we were sort of growing everywhere, but we weren't profitable. We were just sitting at break even in that entirety. And so I would say, like this year for me has been, you know, let's say a, a year of maturation and realizing that less is more. Yes. As much as everyone tells you that, you know, it's very hard. Pick your battles, to t- right? Battles and, and and reduce your focus and yeah. be really really good. At a few things, I'd say I, I feel that at a personal level, but at a business level, the same is to be true. So I'd say like coming back to the bootstrapping nature of it, I think that leveraging the Philippines was sort of the, the gateway to being able to achieve this. But then what's more is like now that we have created consolidated focus, we're really seeing, you know, we're finally, you know, five years in starting to see a business that has like real legs and 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 has some serious viability and if we can continue to to, to bring in more profitable uh, dollars and reinvest it into bringing in higher level talent and starting to build even you know more intentionally on those ratios of bringing more senior leaders into the company then I, then i can see you know that eventual hockey stick uh, experience happening and that's I, I would say that's some of the learnings I've had from a bootstrap pers- perspective and um, the really interesting thing that um, doesn't keep me up at night, uh, so to speak, but I would say that this is one of the value propositions of a, you know, being like venture backed or P backed or wherever you're getting your capital from is I remember thinking throughout the journey, like, man, we never would have built a Scala if like we were venture backed because they wouldn't have let us do that. But like sure. we got to do this and then it's like, well, then we did Southcon. I'm like, see, we wouldn't have been able to do this. But you realize that these companies have loads of experience and the reason why they don't let you do these things is because it's a distraction. And and so having, you know, a, a, an adult in the room or, or being beholden to some relationship like that probably would have, shortened our experience and so i see a lot of value in it it's just about what level of control are you prepared to give up and i think just picking like the right investor relationship is 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 probably so critical as it relates to that interesting so just pick your battles focus on the right business units that uh you feel more comfortable with and just zero in um and, and you show the world your commitment for the topic right and uh, there is more tendency to work with you obviously when you're totally focused on that and your roadmap are aligned and that's uh absolutely th- these are great 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 tips so um yoni i usually ask my guests about work-life balance and what are the things that they do outside of work i don't know if how much time you have outside of the work but i'd love to learn from you you know how do you relax how do you unwind what do you do outside of business yeah, I mean, it's definitely changed throughout the, the the journey. I would say, like, you know, we didn't take salaries for the first year of the business. And yeah. Living in Tel Aviv, that's a very challenging <laughs> thing. <laughs> that's a very challenging thing to do. I moved in with my then girlfriend, now wife, and she had a housemate, and I was renting out my place. Like, you just have to sort of make these things work. But um, coming back to it, my work life balance has gotten uh, better through necessity. I've got two small kids now, so. You know, you have to be there to support, so uh, it's definitely better. Today's not a good day. I'm trying to hit the the Pacific uh, time zone, and that's pretty shitty with us. But (laughs) outside of work, you know, I'm in the gym um, three days a week. I'm walking, you know, probably 14,000, 15,000 steps a day. Um, You know, I hobbyist uh, DJ. Uh, You know, I still get to hang out with my friends. Nice. Um, You know, I'm... I, I, I'm also fortunate that my work gets to take me around the world. So um, I get to speak at events and go to conferences and you know, I, I definitely enjoy the places that, that I get to uh, to experience. So yeah, I'd say a pretty, pretty a relatively healthy work-life balance, but hopefully next year will be even better. Yes. Anything that involves kids is always good you know, for me. So that's, uh, that's great. Great. <laughs> Uh, so Yoni, I mean, how people can find you and the companies? Yeah. yeah, so you can find, I mean, if you're looking at like specifically our services, if you just go to weareescala.com or multiply me, spelled with a me is mii.com, then you can easily find um, where to to sort of operate or work with us. Um, if you want to find me personally, Yoni Kosminski on LinkedIn, I'm, I'm relatively active there or Yoni at Either of those email, emails will get you to me. Nice. And the only final tips for businesses or brands out there? 
final tips. Uh, I mean, just to draw on what I was saying before, yeah. it, you know, it's all about focus. And like you said, picking your battles. So while your ideas may change over the course of time and your business will evolve, don't, you know, if I could give myself, my younger self, some advice, it's just stick the course, build a really great profitable business that's focused and then start to explore what's next and what's next but only once you're there should you start to sort of look left and right because that shiny object sy syndrome will ultimately uh you know cost you you know yeah. a lot at least uh, that's been my experience and probably when you're in that stage it's, this is the right time to to call multiply me for some help on execution and growth right 100%. <laughs> okay, Yoni, it's really a pleasure. Really appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It was great. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us on this episode. Your support means the world to us. If today's episode has been insightful for you, consider sharing it with someone who would also benefit. Even one share can make a big difference. Looking to elevate your e-commerce game? Discover Vimy, a multi-channel e-commerce platform that will transform your business with the power of shoppable video. Visit us at vimy.net to learn more. It's vimy, V-I-M-M-I dot net. Thank you for being part of our journey. Stay tuned for more invaluable insights in our next episode.